Hello, it is Ashley with STM's Crime and Paranormal Podcast. Yep. Today we are going to talk about a man known as Albert Fish. Okay, so Albert Fish's real name is Hamilton Howard Albert Fish. Um, he was born on May 19th of 1870 in Washington, D.C. He, um, he is an American serial killer, a rapist, a child rapist, and a cannibal. So we'll get into those details here shortly. Um, he was also known as the Gray Man, the Werewolf of Wisteria, the Brooklyn Vampire, the Moon Maniac, and the Boogeyman. So real life Boogeyman. Um, his parents were Randall and Ellen Fish. Randall was American with English ancestry and Ellen was Scots-Irish American. Um, Fish's father was 43 years older than Fish's mother and he was 75 years old whenever Albert was born. So his father was a riverboat captain um, and then in 1870 he became a fertilizer manufacturer, manufacturer, sorry. Um, in 1875, Randall did die of a heart attack because he was he was quite a bit older. Um, Albert was the youngest out of three living siblings. Um, he wanted to be known as Albert after a dead sibling, and he wanted to escape the nickname of Ham and Eggs that was given to him at an orphanage that he had spent most of his childhood at. So his mother would put him in St. John's Orphanage in Washington, where fish would often be abused. Um, however, fish would soon begin to enjoy the physical pain from these beatings that he would get in this orphanage. Albert's family had a history of mental illness, which obviously we're seeing with Albert with him um, getting a joy out of being beaten. So his uncle suffered from mania. Uh, his brother, one of his brothers, was actually in a state mental hospital, and one of his sisters was diagnosed with mental affliction. Three other relatives of his were also diagnosed with mental illness, and his mother would have visual hallucinations. So mental illness just ran in his family pretty pretty deeply. Um, in 1880, his mother ended up at a government job, and then she was able to move, and then she was able to move and remove fish from the orphanage. So, at the age of 12, fish would start a relationship with a telegraph boy. This boy would introduce odd things to fish, such as, and I'm probably saying this wrong, but it's called urolagnia. Um, which is drinking urine, and coprophagia, which is eating feces. And like I said, I probably said those two wrong. Um, soon, Fish would then start going to public baths so he could watch the other boys undress. He would spend a lot of his weekends doing this. So this was like his weekend, uh, this is his weekend fun. This is what he did on the weekends for fun, which is absolutely disturbing. Through Fish's life, he would often write women obscene letters that he would find. Um, he would find these women's names through classified advertising and matrimonial agencies. So he would he would go through the newspaper, find um, information on these women, and he would start writing them just obscene obscene letters, which is disturbing. Also, so. In 1890, by the time that Fish was 20 years old, he would arrive in New York City. At this point, he had became a prostitute and he started to rape younger boys. In 1898, Fish's mother would actually end up arranging a marriage for him with a girl by the name of Anna Marie Hoffman, who was nine years younger than Fish. They would have six children together by the names of Albert, Anna, Gertrude, Eugene, John, and Henry Fish. Um, all through 1989, he would work as a house painter. Fish would state that he still continued to molest children that were mainly boys younger than the age of six. 
So, um, later on, Albert would recount an incident of when a male lover would take him to a waxworks museum where he grew fascinated by a bisection of a penis. Um, he has stated that after this is when he then became obsessed with sexual mutilation. In 1903, Albert was then arrested and convicted of grand larceny where he would serve his time in Sing Sing Prison. Um, Around 1910, uh, Fish was now working in Wilmington, Delaware, around around this time. Um, This is where he would meet a man named Thomas Keaton, who was 19 years old. Um, After meeting Keaton, Fish would then take him to where he was staying, and the two would begin a a sadomasochistic relationship sorry if i said that wrong however no one knows if this relationship was mutual or if fish was more likely forcing keaton to have this type of relationship um it is said that keaton was intellectually disabled so after 10 days fish would then take keaton to an old farmhouse and this is where he would begin to torture keaton um it took place, the torturing took place over a course of two weeks. And Fish would tie up Keaton and cut half of his penis. Fish was quoted to say, quote, I shall never forget his scream or the look he gave me, unquote. Fish had intended to kill Keaton and cut up his body so he could then take him home. However, Fish would worry that the hot weather would draw attention to him. So he ended up pouring peroxide over Keenan's wound, wrapped him in a, or wrapped, wrapped in a handkerchief that was covered in Vaseline, left him with $10, and kissed him goodbye before he left. Fish would be quoted to then say, quote, took first train I could get back home, never heard what become of him, or tried to find out, unquote. So in January 1917, Fish's wife would then leave him for a John Straub, um, who was a handyman who boarded with the Fish family. So after she had left with Straub, Fish would then have to raise his six children as a single parent. The kids would recall that Albert Fish would ask them to play a a sadomasochistic game with him which involved him asking the children to paddle him with a nail-filled paddle until blood would run down his legs. Fish stated that when his wife had left him, she had took nearly every position or every possession that they had owned ever. Um, Albert would then begin to start acting strange after this. So it's reported that he would begin to experiment with self-harm and would push needles into his groin. He had also enjoyed hitting himself with a nail-studded paddle. And it is alleged that he would st- that he would insert a lighter fluid soaked wooden dowel into his anus and set it on fire. So he would then soon start to have auditory hallucinations. So he was starting to hear things. Um, It is said that he had once wrapped himself in carpet, saying that John the Apostle had instructed him to do so. So between 1919 and 1930s, um, around 1990, Fish had stabbed a boy in Georgetown, Washington, D.C., that was intellectually disabled. Um, He would always pick out people, like his victims were always mentally handicapped or African American. Um, He explained the reasoning for this was because he assumed that these people would not be missed after they had been killed. Um, Fish would also claim to have paid other boys to lure in children for him. So he had a a few accomplices, I guess. Um, He would torture, mutilate, and murder young children with his implements of hell, which were a meat cleaver, 
a butcher knife, and a small handsaw. So these were his implements of hell that he called them. So in July 11th, 1924, Fish had found an eight-year-old by the name of Beatrice Keel. Um, she was playing alone on her parents' farm in Staten Island, New York. So Fish offered Keel money to come and help him look for rhubarb. While she was about to leave with him, her mother would end up chasing Fish away. Now, if that isn't crazy enough, Fish would then return back later to the Keel's barn and try to sleep. However, Mr. Keel would discover him and force him to leave. So only three days after this incident, Fish would then kill a Francis McDonnell that also lived in Staten Island. Um, also during the year of 1924, a 54-year-old Albert would suffer from psychosis and would say God was commanding him to torture and sexually mutilate children. So not long before he abducted Grace Bud, Albert would attempt to test out his implements of hell on a child that he, that he had been molesting by the name of Cyril Quinn. So when Cyril and his friends were playing a game called box ball on a sidewalk, Fish would approach them and he would ask if they had had lunch yet. The kids said they had not eaten lunch yet, um, so Fish would invite them to his apartment to eat some sandwiches. So while the two boys were wrestling around and playing on Albert's bed, they somehow moved the mattress to reveal a knife, a small handsaw, and a meat cleaver underneath of this mattress. This would frighten the boys so bad that they would run out of Fish's apartment. Albert Fish would then get remarried. On February 6th of 1930, um, in Waterloo, New York, Albert would go on to marry uh, Estella Wilcox, but the two had divorced after only one week of marriage. Fish was then arrested in May of 1930 for sending obscene letters to women who had answered an ad for a maid. So after that arrest and another arrest in 1931, he was then sent to Bellevue Psychiatric Hospital for observations. So one of his murders that um, is pretty well known and, and kind of turned some, some things around was the murder of Grace Budd. Um, on May 25th in 1928, Albert would see a classified ad in a Sunday edition of the New York World. The advertisement would say, Young man, 18, wishes position in country, Edward Budd, 406 West 15th Street. On May 28th, Fish, who was 58 years old at this time, had decided to visit the Budd family in Manhattan under the impression that he would hire Edward. He would confess later on that he had planned to tie Edward up mutilate him and leave him until he had bled to death. Albert would introduce himself to the Bud family as Frank Howard, who was a farmer in Farmingdale, New York. So he had promised that he would hire Edward and his friend Willie, stating he would send for them in a few days. So although Albert later failed to send for the two boys and would send a telegram to the family apologizing, he would then set up another date to send for them. Albert would later return, and this is when he had met Edward's younger sister by the name of Grace Budd. Um, he would then change his victim from Edward to Grace. While being at the house, he had made up a story stating that he was going to be attending his niece's birthday party. So Fish would convince Grace's parents, Delia Flanagan and Albert Budd the first, to let Grace go to his niece's birthday party with him that night. Um, Grace would then leave with Albert, and she never returned home. Police would then arrest the superintendent by the name of Charles Edward Pope, whom was 66 years old, in the disappearance of Grace Budd. Pope's estranged wife would be the one to make these accusations that um, Charles Pope was the one that had took Grace Budd. 
So Pope would then serve 108 days in jail from his arrest date to his trial date, which was December 22nd of 1930. He was then found not guilty of these accusations. Um, a letter was sent to the mother of Grace Bunn. Um, it was an anonymous letter, and it was sent in November of 1934. The letter would be what had actually ended up leading the police officers to fish in, um, in the case of Grace Bunn. However, Grace's mother, she was not, she was illiterate, so she was unable to read the letter, so she had to have her son read it to her. There is quite a bit of significant misspellings and grammatical errors in Fish's letter, but I will read it word for word, um, and it is going to read as followed. My dear Mrs. Bud, in 1894... A friend of mine shipped as a deckhand on the steamer Tacoma Captain John Davis. They sailed from San Francisco to Hong Kong, China. On arriving there, he and two others went ashore and got drunk. When they returned, they was gone. At that time, there was a famine in China. Meat of any kind was from $1 to $3 a pound. So great was the suffering among the very poor that all children under 12 were sold to the butchers to be cut up and sold for food in order to keep others from starving. A boy or girl under 14 was not safe in the street. You could go in any shop and ask for steak, chops, or stew meat. Part of the naked body of a boy or girl would be brought out and just what you want it cut from it. A boy or girl's behind, which is the sweetest part of the body and sold as veal cutlet, brought the highest price. John stayed there so long he acquired a taste for human flesh. On his return to New York, he stole two boys, one seven, one eleven, took them to his home, stripped them naked, tied them in a closet, then burned everything they had on. Several times, every day and night, he spanked them, tortured them to make their meat good and tender. First, he killed the 11-year-old boy because he had the fattest ass and, of course, the most meat on it. Every part of his body was cooked and eaten except head, bones, and guts. He was roasted in the oven all of his ass, boiled, broiled, fried, stewed. The little boy was next, went the same way. At that time, I was living at 409 East 100th Street, rear right side. He told me so often how good human flesh was, I made up my mind to taste it. On Sunday, June the 3rd, 1928, I called on you at 406 West 15th Street. Brought you pot cheese, strawberries. We had lunch. Grace sat in my lap and kissed me. I made up my mind to eat her on the pretense of taking her to a party. You said yes, she should go. I took her to an empty house in West Chester. I had already picked out. When we got there, I told her to remain outside. She picked wildflowers. I went upstairs and stripped all my clothes off. I knew if I did not, I would get her blood on them. When all was ready, I went to the window and called her. Then I hid in the closet until she was in the room. When she saw me all naked, she began to cry and tried to run down the stairs. I grabbed her, and she said she would tell her mama. First, I stripped her naked, how she did kick, bite, and scratch. I choked her to death, then cut her in small pieces so I could take my meat to my rooms, cook, and eat it. How sweet and tender her little ass was roasted in the oven. It took me nine days to eat her entire body. I did not fuck her, though. I could have had I wished. She died a virgin. That was the disgusting letter he wrote to Grace's parents and the disgusting things that he did to poor Grace. So police would then investigate the letter that was sent to the buds. 
Um, they could not, however, verify um, the story of Captain Davis and the famine in Hong Kong. The sad, accurate part of the letter was the murder of Grace, though. That was a sadly very accurate. Um, the description of how the kidnapping happened and the other events, the only thing that they could not confirm was if he had eight parts of Grace's body or not, which no one Albert Fish, he probably did. Um, so Albert Fish was captured and um, we'll get to how he was captured. So the letter that Fish had sent in an envelope happened to have a small hexagonal um, emblem with the letter NYPCBA, which stood for New York Private Chauffeurs Chauffeurs Bene, Ben Benevolent Association. Um, a janitor from the company had told police that he had taken some of the stationary paper home, but had left it at his rooming house, addressed 200 East 52nd Street, when he had moved out. So police began checking into this place on 52nd Street and spoke with the landlady that was over the rooming house. She had stated that Fish had checked out of that particular room just a few days beforehand. So the landlady had said that Albert's son had sent him money and he would then ask her to hold his next check for him. So the chief investigator on this case was William F. King and King would wait outside of the room until Albert Fish had returned. So once, re once Fish had returned, um, he had agreed to go to the headquarters for questioning, but he would then brandish a razor blade. At this point, King had gotten the razor blade from Fish and took him into headquarters himself. He, uh, Albert would, would make no attempt to even deny that he had murdered Grace Bud. Um, he even said that he had actually meant to go to the Bud's house for Grace's brother, Edward. So he... He told investigators this. Um, Albert said, and quoted, that it never even entered his head to rape Grace, but he would later tell his attorney that while he was kneeling on her chest and strangling the young girl, he had two involuntary ejaculations. This information was then used at Albert's trial to make the kidnapping claim sexually motivated to where they avoided any mention of cannibalism. So there was more crimes that were discovered after Albert Fish was arrested. Um, Francis McDonnell was one of his victims. On the night of July 14th of 1924, Francis was only nine years old when he was reported missing by his parents. The child would not return home after he was playing catch with his friends in the Port Richmond neighborhood of Staten Island. So after a search was conducted, organizers would then find his body that was hanging by a tree in the woods near his home. Francis was sexually assaulted and had been strangled by his own suspenders. Autopsy would reveal he would also have suffered extensive lacerations on his legs and his abdomen. His left hamstring had almost been completely stripped off the bone. Albert would not claim to be responsible for Francis's murder, but later he then stated he had intentions of actually castrating the boy, but ran when he thought he had heard someone coming. So when Francis's friend was questioned by police, they would state that he had been taken by an elderly man that had a gray mustache. A neighbor had also told the police that they had observed Francis with a man that looked similar to how the other boys would describe him. They stated he, was, he would be walking along a path of grass into the woods. So Anna McDonnell, which is Francis's mother, had said she had seen the same man earlier that day. She would go on to report that he came shuffling down the street mumbling to himself and making queer motions with his hands. I saw his thick gray hair and his drooping gray mustache. Everything about him seemed faded and gray. The description everyone gave about the strange man is what made him known as the gray man. So Francis's murder was not solved until after Grace Budd was murdered. 
Several witnesses, such as the farmer Hans Kiel, had identified fish as the guy seen around Port Richmond the day that Francis had disappeared. Later, attorney Thomas J. Walsh would announce that he was going to indict Fish for the murder of Francis McDonnell. Fish would deny the charges at first, but in March of 1935, after they had concluded Grace Budd's murder and Fish's confession of another murder, which we will get to next, Albert would then confirm to the investigators that he did indeed rape and murder Francis. So once his confessions was made public, the New York Daily Mirror would then write about the disclosure that solidified Albert's reputation as the most vicious child slayer in criminal history. So let's go to four-year-old Billy Gaffney. That is another one of Albert's victims. Um, On February 11th of 1927, a Billy Beaton, whom was three years old, and his brother, whom was 12 years old, were playing in an apartment hallway located in Brooklyn with four-year-old Billy Gaffney. The 12-year-old boy would then leave the apartment when both boys would disappear. Billy Beaton had ended up being found on the roof at the apartments. They had asked Beaton what had happened to Gaffney, and he would reply, the boogeyman took him. So, they had never recovered the body of Billy Gaffney. Um, They did have another suspect in Gaffney's murder, um, who was serial killer Peter Kudzinwinski. Kudzinwinski? But a man named Joseph Meehan, who was a motorman on the Brooklyn trolley, would see a picture of Albert Fish. And in the newspaper, he would see the picture and would identify him as the old man he had seen on the same day Billy Gaffney had went missing. So this was very important. Um, So Joseph said that this old man had tried getting the little boy that was sitting with him on the trolley to be quiet. Billy was not wearing a jacket and had started crying for his mother when he was then dragged by this man on and off the trolley. When Billy Beaton described this boogeyman, this had been an exact identification of Fish. So the Manhattan Missing Persons Bureau investigators would then find out that Fish had been employed as a house painter by a Brooklyn real estate company during February of 1927. They would also find out that Fish was working at a location only a few miles where Gaffney was abducted on that same day. So Albert would then write yet another letter, but to his attorney this time, that reads, I brought him to Riker Avenue, Dumps. There is a house that stands alone, not far from where I took him. I took the G-boy there, strapped him naked, or stripped him naked, and tied his hands and feet and gagged him with a piece of dirty rag I picked up out of the dump. Then I burned his clothes, threw his socks in the dump, Then I walked back and took trolley to 59th Street at 2 a.m. and walked home from there. Next day, about 2 p.m., I took tools. A good heavy cat uh, cat of nine tails, homemade, short handle, cut one of my belts in half, slit his legs, I cut off his ears, nose, slit his mouth from ear to ear, gouged out his eyes. He was dead then. I stuck the knife in his belly and held my mouth to his body and drank his blood. I picked up four old potato sacks and gathered a pile of stones. Then I cut him up. I had a grip with me. I put his nose, ears, and a few slices of his belly in the grip. Then I cut him through the middle of his body, just below his belly button, then through his legs about two inches below his behind. I put this in my grip with a lot of paper. I cut off the head, feet, arms, hands, and the legs below the knee. This I put in sacks weighed with stones, tied the ends and threw them into the pools of slimy water you will see all along the road going to North Beach. Water is three to four foot deep. They sink at once. I came home with my meat. I had the front of his body I liked best. His monkey and peewees and a nice little fat behind to roast in the oven and eat. I made a stew out of his ears, nose, pieces of his face, and belly. 
I put onions, carrots, turnips, celery, salt, and pepper. It was good. Then I split the cheeks of his behind open, cut off his monkey and peewees, and washed them first. I put strips of bacon on each cheek of his behind and put in the oven. Then I picked four onions, and when meat had roasted about a fourth of an hour, I poured about a pint of water over it for gravy and put in the onions. At frequent intervals, I basted his behind with a wooden spoon so the meat would be nice and juicy. In about two hours, it was nice and brown, cooked through. I never ate any roast turkey that tasted half as good as his sweet, fat, little behind did. I ate every bit of the meat in about four days. His little monkey was as sweet as a nut and his peewees I could not chew. Threw them in the toilet. This man is so vile. So it, and it's hard reading these two letters because it's, it's just sick, sick hearing what he did and how he felt. And there's just no remorse. These are, these are people, these are kids. Okay. These are not, they're not animals. Um, I don't know. It, it blows my mind. Um, Billy Gaffney's mother would visit Albert Fish in Sing Sing. Detective King and two other men would go with her. Um, Elizabeth, who was Billy's mother, wanted to ask about her son's death. Albert Fish, however, would refuse to speak with her, and he would then begin to cry and would ask to be left alone. So, two hours of his lawyer, Jane Stimpsey, asking him questions, Mrs. Gaffney would then give up with getting an answer from Fish. Um, however, she was still maintaining and convinced that Albert was who had killed her son. It is alleged that after he was captured, he would admit to molesting more than 400 children and torturing and killing several of them, although it's unknown if the statement was even true. Um, so for his trial and execution, on March 11th of 1935 is when the trial of Grace Budd would begin in White Plains, New York, as Frederick P. Close, the presiding judge and Westchester County Chief Assistant District Attorney Albert F. Gallagher, whom was prosecuting attorney in the trial. James Dempsey, who was a former prosecutor and a one-time mayor of Peekskill, New York, is the defense counsel for Albert Fish. His trial would last 10 days. Um, Albert Fish would plead insanity and had claimed that he had heard voices from God telling him to kill this ch these children. Um, although a few psychiatrists would testify about Fish's sexual fetishes that had included sadism, masochism, flagellation, exhibitionism, foyerism, picurism, cannibalism, coprophagia, urophilia, hematolagnia, pedophilia, necrophilia, and infibulation, Dempsey would note that Fish was a psychiatric phenomenon and that there was never any other individual in legal or medical records that would possess so many sexual abnormalities. Um, the defense expert witness, Frederick Wortham, who was a psychiatrist specializing in child development, was who had conducted the psychiatric exams for the New York courts. So Wortham tried to explain that Fish's obsession with religion and a preoccupation with the biblical story of Abraham and Isaac um, Fish believed that sacrificing a boy would be self-punishment for his own sins, even if what he was doing was wrong, that the angels would prevent it um, if God did not approve. Um, he would attempt the sacrifice once before, um, but he had stopped because Carr had ended up driving by. So that's when Edward Budd had become his next intended victim. But since Edward was much larger than Fish had expected him to be, that's when he decided to settle with his little sister, Grace. Um, they believe that Albert Fish had perceived Grace Budd as a boy, being boys were his personal preference. Albert would associate cannibalism with communion. Um, one of the last questions that Dempsey had asked Wortham was a long 15,000 words. It would detail Fish's life and had ended with asking this doctor how he would consider Fish's mental status based on his life. Wortham would then answer that he was insane. Gallagher would then cross-examine Wortham on if he knew that Fish would know the difference between right and wrong. 
Wortham would respond back that he did not know, but it was a perverted knowledge based on his opinions of sin, atonement, and religion. So he would say that it was insane knowledge. Defense would then call two more psychiatrists, two more psychiatrists, to support Wortham's claims. One of the rebuttal witnesses was a Menes Gregory, who was a former manager of the Bellevue Psychiatric Hospital where Albert had been treated in the year of 1930. So Gregory would testify that he was abnormal, abnormal, however, he was indeed sane. So during cross-examination, cross Dempsey would then ask if coprophilia, urophilia, and pedophilia would indicate if someone was sane or insane. Gregory would then reply back to Dempsey that any such type of person was not mentally sick and they were actually common perversions that were said to be socially perfectly all right and that Albert was no different than millions of other people, some of whom were very prominent and successful that also suffered from the same perversions. So another witness who was the resident physician at the tombs um, named Perry Leichenstein. Dempsey would object that a doctor that had no training in psychiatry should be testifying on the issue of sanity. Justin Close, however, Justice Close, however, would overrule that objection, stating that the jury could decide what weight the prison doctor would have. So Leichenstein was then asked when Albert would cause himself pain if that would mean he would have a mental condition. Leichenstein would then reply, that is not masochism, and he was only punishing himself to get sexual gratification. Another witness by the name of Charles Lambert would then testify that coprophilia was a common practice and that religion cannibalism may be psychopathic, but it was a matter of taste and not evidence of psychosis. So the last witness, James Va Vavasor, would then repeat Lambert's opinion. Mary Nichols was also another witness um, of the defense. She was Fish's 17-year-old stepdaughter. She would state that Albert would teach her and her brother and sisters several games that would involve overtones of masochism and child molestation. None of those jurors had doubted that Albert Fish was insane, but one of the jurors would then explain they had felt he should be executed anyway. So they had found him to be sane and guilty. The judge would then order a death sentence. Albert would then arrive at the prison on March 1935 and was executed on January 16th of 1936, being electrocuted by the electric chair at the Sing Sing prison. So he would then go into the chamber at 11.06 p.m., and would be pronounced dead only three minutes later. Fish was buried um, in the Sing Sing Prison Cemetery. It said that Albert had even helped the executioner position the electrodes on his body. The last words that Albert Fish would reportedly say was, I don't even know why I'm here. One witness that was present at his execution would say that it would take two jolts before Albert died. So rumor had it, that the apparatus was short-circuited by the needles that Albert Fish had inserted into his body. The rumors, however, were then regarded as not true and that he would die in the same manner and time frame of others that were executed by the electric chair. James Dempsey, Fish's lawyer, would later reveal after, ex after the execution to reporters that he was in possession of his client's final statement. There, was a several, there were several pages of handwritten notes that Albert had wrote just hours prior to his execution. While he was asked by a journalist to reveal the letters, he would refuse and stated that, I will never show it to anyone. It was the most filthy string of obscenities that I have ever read. Albert Fish's known victims were Francis X. McDonnell, which was age eight, murdered July 15th, 1924. Billy Gaffney, age four, murdered February 11th, 1927. Grace Budd, age 10, murdered June 3rd, 3rd of 1928. Albert would also be suspected in five other murders. Those victims were Emma Richardson, age five, murdered October 3rd of 1926. Yetta Abramowitz, age 12, murdered in 1927. 
Robin Jane Liu, age six, murdered May 2nd of 1931. Mary Ellen O'Connor, age 16, murdered February 15th of 1932. Benjamin Collings, age 17, murdered December 15th of 1932. Several quotes from Albert Fish. So I have some quotes from Albert Fish that I will read off and some of them are definitely disturbing. Um, so here are some of his quotes. The first one, I like children, they are tasty. What a thrill that will be if I have to die in the electric chair. It will be the supreme thrill, the only one I haven't tried. I have no particular desire to live. I have no particular desire to be killed. It is a matter of indifference to me. I do not think I am altogether right. I always had a desire to inflict pain on others and to have others inflict pain on me. I always seem to enjoy everything that hurt. Going to the electric chair will be the supreme thrill of my life. Misery leads to crime. I saw so many boys whipped, it ruined my mind. None of us are saints. Those are quoted from Albert Fish. Uh, that will wrap up my podcast on him. Um, he's just very, very vile. Um, I believe there was also a movie made, maybe. I'll have to look and see, and if I can find it, I will link all those um, things that were in the media on him. So that concludes the story of Albert Fish and his just a terrible person. Um, thank you guys for listening today. Stay safe. Um, good morning, good night, wherever you are in this world. And we will see you at the next podcast. Thank you so much.